Welcome back to KDK's debate between candidates in the 17th Congressional District. Republican Keith Rothfuss and Democrat Connor Lamb. We'll resume the questioning now with my colleague John Delano. John. Uh, Mr. Lamb, when you last debated here during the special election, you told us that the very first bill that you would write and introduce in Congress, if elected, would be to tackle the opioid and heroin epidemic, clearly a major problem in this region. But so far, you have written five bills, four of which deal with veterans' affairs and one on chemical screening devices for law enforcement, none on opioids. Have you switched priorities? And if elected to a full two-year term, what's the one issue you want to tackle going forward? Actually, John, uh, my first bill was just passed and signed by the president, and it dealt with opioids directly. In fact, what it did uh, was it clarified and made more accessible the guidelines for prescribing opioid medications. That's really the root of this whole crisis is opioid medications were overprescribed by doctors for a long time. It was rolled into the recent opioids package that passed both houses of Congress uh, on a bipartisan basis. Um, the chemical screening bill that you mentioned is also an opioids uh, bill because what it does is allows police to test for fentanyl, which is slightly different from heroin and much more deadly. And I found when I was working as a prosecutor that cops would go to the scene of a crime, they would recover a drug, and they wouldn't know whether it was heroin or fentanyl. But the punishment for fentanyl is much more severe, and so we needed to know that early in the case to decide how we would prosecute. And so I'm trying to fix that by making sure they can get the equipment they need to do those tests. Uh, Mr. Rothfuss, you've been in Congress for nearly six years. And although you've written and introduced uh, 47 bills over those years, frankly, it's hard for the public to identify any one single issue or legislative accomplishment uh, with you, uh, any more than it is with Mr. Lamb, who's been there much, much less time. So can you name your most important legislative accomplishment? Well, I've had a number of pieces of legislation that actually have been made law, signed by the president, including parts of the recent opioid bill that the president signed, including the Regroup Act, which triples funding for a Department of Justice program, very critical to help our local agencies. Beaver County, for example, has received a grant for that program. Again, this is all hands on deck dealing with the opioid crisis. Legislation that I've done uh, with Kurt Schrader from Oregon to restore the right of seniors to switch Medicare Advantage plans, part of the 21st Century Cures Act. Very critical, particularly around this area where we have these competing health care institutions and people may want to be able to switch their Medicare Advantage plan after the open enrollment. See, the Affordable Care Act took that right away from seniors. I restored that right to seniors. So I continue to advocate for uh, legislative proposals back here, back, going back a couple of years, making sure that the water resources infrastructure bill had the uh, authorization for the Ohio River locks and dams. And so we continue, continue to do the work on the financial services committee, make sure we have capital flowing to our communities. Uh, legislation that was included in the banking reform bill to help local banks, local institutions, mutual banks, uh, significant piece of legislation. Let me follow up by asking each of you, because it's one thing for us to ask the debate questions when you're here with us, but the public wants the opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, will you commit Mr. Rothfuss and Mr. Lamb as well to holding public town hall meetings if you are reelected in the 17th Congressional District? I'll take that first. I have had uh, countless meetings with constituents. I know you're talking about a formal town hall, which unfortunately we saw the resist movement decide to interrupt town halls, uh, make, making sure that they would rather have a demonstration than a dialogue or a confrontation as opposed to a, co a conversation. I've done 15 telephone town halls over the last two years, reached 30 thousand constituents who were able to get online, ask questions. In addition to that, I've had over 600 meetings across this district uh, working with people, meeting with constituents, including 100 right in my district offices, where people of all views have been welcome to come in and share what they, 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 they were concerned about. So you about. will not commit to holding any public town hall meetings if elected? I think in the environment that we have, where you have people who have intentionally decided to, to disrupt these meetings and... Uh, you know, I, I, even when I was doing my coffee with Keith's, we would have people come in and, and be more interested in having a confrontation than a dialogue. Mr. Lamb, will you hold public town hall meetings? Uh, I'll give you a direct answer, John. Yes. Uh, I've done it several times already as a congressman, I think four or five times. Uh, and my rule is simple. I'll take any question in the House. Uh, we haven't had the problem that Mr. Rothfuss has mentioned yet, even though many of my own constituents feel passionately about issues where they disagree with me. But each time we've done it, we've walked out of the room as friends, and I think that's part of the job. Mr. Rothfuss, you get the last word. This movement isn't targeting 
Democrats. The resist movement has been targeting Republicans. Okay. Lynn Hayes, you're up. Mr. Rothfuss, you're both already serving in Congress, but now you're running to represent district. I'm interested in knowing what you've learned about this new district during the campaign. How would you explain it to someone who wasn't familiar with District 17? How would you explain what's happening in the district to someone who's never been there? And lastly, how would you describe the people in that district and what's uniquely important to them? I describe the district as being a good chunk of western Pennsylvania, similar to the, the area that I currently represent. Yes, it's a little more compact, a little more dense. Uh, it's pretty much confined to Beaver County, Allegheny County, and a small sliver of Butler County. I always talk about this region as having unique aspects. Nowhere else in the country, I think, do you have world-class players in so many different fields, whether it's financial services, whether it's health care, whether it's education, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's energy, whether it's the infrastructure that we're working with. Having a, a tremendous number of veterans in, our, uh, in, in western Pennsylvania, really the highest number of veterans in the country without having a major military base nearby. Uh, senior issues are important. Um, this is a, a great community. It's, I'm proud to represent it and look forward to continuing to represent it as I continue to reach out to the areas uh, that I'm a added or combined in this district. Those sound like all positives. Are there challenges? Are oh, there absolutely. hardships? Absolutely there's challenges. Uh, we got to make sure that the prosperity that is taking hold in this country is continuing to spread everywhere. Uh, this is why I'm a big fan of that Opportunity Zone program, getting into communities like McKees Rocks and Aliquippa and Midland and uh, Aetna, uh, making sure that the prosperity that is taking hold across the country is broad-based, getting every person back in the game again. Mr. Lamb, same question to you. I can repeat it if you'd like. Uh, bottom line is, how would you describe this new district? How would you describe it to someone who's never been to this area? I think what has struck me the most is just how proud people are, not just to be from Western Pennsylvania, not just to be from Pittsburgh, but to be from Aliquippa, to be from Rochester, to be from Shaler or McKees Rocks. I mean, people around here love their town. They wear the high school football team sweatshirt on Fridays, and it's unmistakable. And I haven't encountered that anywhere else that I've been in the country or the world. Uh, people are frustrated about politics, and so I just think the biggest challenge is trying to give people some sense of hope that it doesn't have to be this way, that the gridlock they've seen for so many years, the shouting back and forth from both sides uh, can finally end. It won't end overnight, but uh, I really do think we can give people in the 17th District a representative that they can be proud of. Mr. Rothfuss? Again, I think it's a great uh, community that we're proud to represent. I think both Mr. Lamb and I have a lot of pride in this region. Um, and uh, people are people, you know, and, and, and you just have to have those meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and, and the environment we live in, the, the, the media environment we live in, the social media environment, uh, it's very difficult to have those communications. People are throwing out 140 character tweets or 30 second sound bites. That's why it's important to get out there and talk with people. And, and hear what, what's on their, 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 their mind, what their hopes are, what their fears are. Mr. Lamb, you have the final word if you'd like it. I think this is an area where Keith and I basically agree, uh, which is a good thing. All right, let's see if we can get back to some disagreement then. Next question, Mr. Lamb, is for you. Some of the uh, most high-profile members of your party, as you well know, are calling for things like free tuition at public colleges, Medicare for all. These would seem to be enormously expensive initiatives. You've criticized rising government debt. So will you fight members of your own party over pro very progressive ideas like these? I hope, Ken, that I don't have to fight anyone. I think we've had enough of that uh, in the past. But I, I take your point, And I have been just as critical of those on my side who call for any policy idea without being honest about how we would pay for it or how we would accomplish it. Um, I think that those policies are pursued with a good heart. I think that uh, people on the more liberal side who want to see college tuition go down, the cost of health care go down, uh, are in the right direction. I just think that the difference is we have to be square with people about how we're going to pay for these ideas. Uh, many of ideas, I think, like the GI Bill, for example, have paid for themselves over the life of their existence, even when our government was deeper in debt after World War II than it is today. So uh, my guiding principle is to look at how something will play out over a generation, how we finance it, and just being straight with people about what we're paying for and what we're getting. So fair to say you're not a Bernie Sanders Democrat? 
I'm a Western Pennsylvania Democrat. Is there a, is there is there a better known uh, political figure in your party right now that you could would more closely identify with? Um, you know, I've just tried to identify as Connor Lamb all year long, and uh, that's not to dodge your question, but uh, I don't think this is as much about personality. I've found that people want to talk about the ideas themselves, how we're going to shore up existing programs, okay. like Medicare, and, and they're satisfied with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rothfuss, let me uh, tailor this a little bit to you, because you mentioned debt earlier, and I want to I return to that. The Trump tax cuts that you supported are projected to create enormous new government debt. Nonpartisan analyses forecast trillions in new debt. You, if I'm not mistaken, are a fiscal conservative, a deficit hawk. Well, then why are you not howling, howling about what critics call an abandonment of fiscal responsibility? Well, this is the reason I voted against the recent funding bill. Again, because I saw capitulation among even people who considered themselves fiscal hawks to throw in the towel and go with the big spending in Washington, D.C. And the demand was when we, when we pay for our defense budget, you have to have an increase in domestic spending as well. There should be no relation between the two. The defense of this country is a function of the threat to this country and what our men and women need to defend this country. And so when you, you, you take a look at the bills that have been coming through, you have to hold the line on spending where you can. Yeah, there are areas where you need to make an investment. The opioid crisis is a very good example where we should be prioritizing funding. But you just can't have across-the-board budget increases the way did with the Bipartisan Budget Act uh, last year. That's the, this is not the time to blow through domestic discretionary spending. With the tax cut, if you grow at just 2.5%, you will more than pay for the tax cut. The, 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 the analysis was that if we stayed stuck at 1.8 or 1.9 percent, yeah, you would collect only $41.5 trillion as opposed to $43 trillion. But with a healthy, growing, dynamic economy, those revenues are coming in. Mr. Office, doesn't the Congressional Budget Office estimate of an additional trillion dollars in debt every year, doesn't that take into account projections of growth? Not the kind of growth that we're going to be seeing, that we're seeing right now. People had given up on the idea that we would ever get back to 4% economic growth. We've had that now for two quarters. The naysayers, the people who are promoting economic stagnation, saying we could never get there again. And as I cited earlier in this debate, the CBO taking a look at the Medicare Part A trust fund, already extending it a year because more people are coming back to work, more people are paying that payroll tax. We have to grow like you've never seen before, getting more people back to work, more people back in the game. And inevitably, we have to have a conversation about immigration because we need workers in this economy. All right, uh, Mr. Lamb. Keith and his colleagues have voted to cut Medicare by hundreds of billions of dollars every year as part of their budget plan. The day after the tax cut passed last December, Paul Ryan came out and to his credit was honest that he was going to go after Social Security and Medicare next. Uh, as you noted, Ken, we don't have to guess about what the tax cut is doing to our deficit. It is increasing it. There's no magic formula by which you cut taxes for wealthy people and revenues rise. We've tried it before in our past. It has never worked. Final word on this, Mr. Rothfuss. Well, again, the same week Mr. Lamb voted for uh, spending that is going out of control and to, to extend tax cuts that he criticized a year ago. Yeah, tax cuts that include folks who are wealthy. That's what he voted for. Uh, again, you can say that we, you know, looking at Medicare, we have a program that we have a moral obligation to save. My parents used that program. And you take a look at the Affordable Care Act that robbed $700 billion out of that program, including $150 billion out of Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage being a very popular program here in Western Pennsylvania. 60% of seniors are using that program. So I'm going to continue to go. fight and defend Medicare. All right, got to move on. John Delano. Uh, Mr. Rothfuss, uh, Social Security is a mess and in crisis, projected to run out of money in just 14 years that would be necessary to pay out full benefits. Uh, so Congress can do several things to prevent this. Uh, you can raise the 6.2 percent Social Security tax. You can lift the cap on income so that those above $128,400 pay the taxes. You can raise the retirement age, now set at 67, to something higher. And you could reduce overall Social Security benefits. Or, of course, Congress could ignore this problem, which is what Congress has been doing for years. Which solution do you favor? You missed one. You missed one. You missed the idea of getting more people back in the game here. You missed the, the, the notion of growing this country. You know, this program right now, you have two and a half people paying in for every single beneficiary, but nobody ever talks about 
how do we get three people paying in or four people paying in or five people paying in? These programs are designed to have a growing, healthy economy, a growing, healthy population. This is why you say inevitably, I say inevitably we have to have a conversation about immigration, about bringing people into this country who want to live the American dream, who are passionate about what this country can be, what it's been you know, for my grandparents when they came to this country, and to have an opportunity to develop your God-given skills and talents and to get in the game of, of this wonderful, beautiful country and to grow. We have to grow, grow, grow. Mr. Rothfuss, I thought you might say that. And the fact is that uh, growth is important, but aren't we at really record growth levels now with more unemployment than ever under the Trump administration? I think you just we're, said that not long ago. We've got to grow the population. We have to get more people into this country. Every time you get somebody back to work, and this is what we just saw with the Medicare uh, Hospital Trust Fund, that they, CBO actually extended the solvency a year because there are more people coming in, more people paying that payroll tax. That not, not only are people realizing their own dream, but that little box on your page stub that says FICA, that's how we fund folks. So, so we, we relax the immigration rules, we bring more people into this country? Is that what you're As arguing? As you have for? a healthy, growing, dynamic economy, growing at 3, 4, 5 percent, you have to look at ways to make this program solvent. You do that with more people. Is, Mr. Lamb, is Mr. Rothfuss right, or is he just avoiding the tough decisions that have to be made by Congress going forward? Well, I'll leave that up to you, John, but we can look at how we voted in the past, and it's pretty simple. His party votes to cut these programs, Social Security and Medicare, every single year. The leader of his party in Congress, Paul Ryan, has been quite open about his intention to raise the retirement age, cut benefits. Uh, this is a clear difference between us. I am proud to be some part of something called the Expand Social Security Caucus. I have co-sponsored legislation called Social Security 2100. It's simple. You don't have to go through uh, this entire scheme of cutting taxes for wealthy people and talking about bringing in more immigrants. Uh, you can change the wage cap as it is currently constructed so that the top 1% of wage earners pay their fair share. That would allow us to expand your benefits, to increase your cost of living adjustments, and to secure the system through 2100. Uh, I'll invite Keith to become a member of the caucus, but I think this is an area where he and I just disagree. Well, let me be clear with you, Mr. Lamb. You're suggesting we raise the tax level so that wealthier people pay more in taxes. Is that your proposal? Uh, I am proposing that above the wage cap as it currently exists, people who are in the top 1% of wage earners uh, start having to pay into Social Security taxes again. Right now, if you're a millionaire in this country, you stopped contributing to Social Security on Valentine's Day last year, February 14th. Uh, I think the wealthy should pay their fair share so that that program is there for everyone. Mr. Rothfuss? You no, know, you can lift the cap on Social Security maybe, maybe, by five years of solvency for the program. Uh, you would fundamentally change the nature of the program. If people are paying that, that payroll tax in, are they going to get much higher benefit coming back? Or are you going to turn this into something other than what Social Security was intended to be? Again, the key is growth, growth, growth. The more people we have back in the game, the better it's going to be able to solve this problem. And I think, Mr. Lamb, you have the last word on this one. The bill is called Social Security 2100. It would guarantee the program through 2100. Guaranteed. We can do it. We just need to vote for it. Ken? All right. Thank you, John. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to try to have a little fun before we wrap up here. I have a series of rapid-fire questions for you. These uh, really call for nothing more than a one-word response in most cases, a name, a yes or a no, or a number. You'll see how it goes. Let me start with you, Mr. Rothfuss. Who is or was the best president in your lifetime? Gosh, um, uh, Ronald Reagan. Mr. Lamb? Bill Clinton. Mr. Lamb, a second Amazon headquarters coming to Pittsburgh. If that happens, good or bad? Good. Mr. Rothfuss? Good. Mr. Rothfuss, excluding this debate, what's your favorite TV show? Oh, gosh, I'll be the real nerd, the Weather Channel. <laughs> Mr. Lamb? Uh, the West Wing. Uh, Mr. Lamb, iPhone or Android? iPhone. Mr. Rothfuss? iPhone. Uh, Mr. Rothfuss, Steelers are now 2-2-1 two, two and one on the season. What will their record be at the oh, end, of, end of the regular uh, season? Um, that's putting us on the spot. Uh, I'll go... Uh, I'll say 10 wins. Uh, we got one tie. So, uh, 10 wins. Five, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that, Mr. Lamb. 13-2-1. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lamb, who is or was the worst president of your lifetime? Let's say your least favorite. Right. Um, I, I think they were all good men. I, I really don't have a least favorite. Mr. Rothfuss? 
Uh, I think that's a great answer because, again, this is an office that we hold in the highest respect. Obviously, there are substantive policy differences I would have had with the Obama. Quick answer, please. So, Obama. All right. Mr. Office, who deserves to be pictured on U.S. currency but is not? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, you know, there was talk about having Harriet Tubman, I think. Okay. Mr. Lamb? Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. Lamb, what news source do you rely on most? Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Mr. Office? Uh, geez, that's uh, probably KDKA radio in the morning. Mr. Office, what's a book everyone should read? Lord of the Rings. Mr. Lamb? Uh, team of Rivals. All right, it's time now. Thank you, gentlemen. It's time now for the candidates' closing statements. The order was determined earlier by coin toss. And Mr. Office, you have the first closing statement. You have 90 seconds, sir. Well, well thank you. I want to thank KDK, the panelists, for your engagement and thank my colleague and competitor, Mr. Lamb. I want to thank the viewers at home, particularly those in Beaver County and Cranberry and the North Hills and Verona, Penn Hills, uh, Oakmont, the West Hills and stretching into the South Hills. Uh, we have a, a, an election coming up and the country gets to make a decision. Do we want to keep up the progress? We have the best econ economic growth we have seen in a very long time, growth numbers that people said could not happen. More and more people finding opportunity, more and more people seeing income in their paychecks. More and more people seeing a new job that they didn't think they'd get. I'm talking about that gentleman who, for example, out in Moon Township told me he had the first raise in 10 years. This economy has to keep growing. We do not want to halt this progress. We do not want to go into gridlock. We have had a very productive two years with this Congress, whether it was tackling opioids, tackling human trafficking, promoting economic growth, making sure our veterans are being taken care of with landmark uh, reforms at the VA. But we have divisions in our country, and not like other times in the country. And I always like to think of Abraham Lincoln and what he must have been thinking. And you take a look at what the country was at in the 1850s, and what did Lincoln do? He appealed to those citizens, to the citizens in our country, to look back, to look back at 1776, to that beautiful document that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. We need to unify around those principles in the Declaration, understand this country can be so much uh, 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 benefit to so many people and to the world. Thank you, Mith Mr. Rothfuss. Mr. Lamb. You've heard about a lot of differences between me and Keith tonight, but above all, I think there's really one difference. I believe in the power of the American government acting on our behalf to do good things for us, to protect us, and to help grow our economy. I believe that the American government, from the moment of its creation, has been a positive force in the lives of our people, and I believe that it still can be. Keith doesn't seem to believe that. I think, I think that's why he votes to cut things and not to improve them. I think that's why his record has been very partisan. And I think that's why his ads have been very negative. I think we need a fresh start. I've called for new leadership in Congress, in my own party, and across the board. People are frustrated with Congress right now. They think we can't do anything, and I understand why. But I'm here to tell you that I am just as proud to serve in the United States Congress today as I was the day that I was sworn in to the United States Marines. And I'm just as excited about the mission. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. On behalf of everyone here at KDK, thanks to the candidates. Thank you for watching this debate. Remember, Election Day is November 6th. I'm Ken Rice. Have a good evening.